The NHL Stanley Cup Finals are well underway. The NBA Finals have started. I'll be curious to see who Jerry thinks is going to win. And we've got a Canadian heading to the semis in Wimbledon. It's Sports Quarant TV. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Sports Quarant TV. With you, as always, Chris Dobson, Jerry Green, coming to you from the Mirror Machine, Jerry I know we, were, we didn't have a live show last week, but we are back here this week. We have a lot to cover and a lot to talk about going back a couple weeks now. Um, hope all is well in your world, man, but let's just dive right into it because the Stanley Cup finals are well underway. The Montreal Canadiens and the Tampa Bay Lightning. Uh, Montreal is in a bit of a hole right now, but overall, how have you felt the playoffs have gone? How do you think the finals have gone? <laughs> well, my goodness, here we are in the second week of July. Right. And, and uh, we're still talking about NHL hockey, which I don't have a problem with. Of course, they started uh, late anyways. And, and uh, played a 52 game schedule. I'm loving it. I'm loving the drama. I'm loving the Montreal Canadiens unpredictability in the game and and uh, winning game uh, number three or, or four rather and forcing a, a game five in Tampa. Um, I, and a game, Chris, I really did think that, that if Tampa uh, concentrated a little bit harder and really wanted to win that, because there was at times they were very dominant, but that is the, the typical game of which you need carry price to make the saves that he's required to make and don't have one going under his arm. Do, doesn't misplay one, that, that sort of thing. If he plays his steady, usual self, I don't care about goalposts. Good goaltenders will tell you the goalposts are part of my equipment. I had that all the way. And that's why it went off the post. I had everything else covered. So he is such an integral part to the whole scenario and Montreal, definitely, we know this from the get-go, needs to score first, but they also need number 31 to be their best player. You're not wrong. Um, and other than maybe two, possibly three goals in this entire series that he would like to have back, Tampa shows exactly why they are so good. You can't make a mistake. You know, the minute you have a turnover, the minute you make one yeah. mistake, that puck's in the back of your net. And I'd love to know the stats right now, and I don't have them here. Maybe I'll have them for next week's show once we can talk about the recap, once the Habs win in seven. Um, we can talk about exactly, you know, what the turnover ratio is for Montreal because these two-on-ones going the other way, it was a, sometimes there was a two-on-oh going the other way. And, you know, overall, watching Tampa do what they do, it, they are so talented. And, I mean, it, it starts the back of the net for them as well. I mean, they've got one of the best goaltenders in the world between the pipes for them right now. Vasilevsky's looked unbelievable. And, you know, mm -hmm. outside of game four, you talked about scoring first. What I want to talk about, uh, and I'm not, like I said, and this is not going to be a pro Montreal Canadiens rant like you usually get all the time, but this is going to be is there's a few aspects that I am very excited about for the future of Montreal. And that is, if you look at what Nick Suzuki has done, future captain, by the way, uh, if you look at exactly how, uh, you know, Cole Caulfield has played, not even a rookie this year, and I think he's got 12 points in 19 playoff games, uh, leads the, the, the league now, only rookie to have primary assists on three overtime goals, in the history of the National Hockey League, um, you know, but there was an adjustment made to game four that I was absolutely all for. And that is, and I've been complaining about it all playoff <laughs> long. And that was why Marilyn <laughs> Gustafson, I remember we had this conversation. We had, no, no, I don't like them either. I know I get it, but why Romanov has not been playing and Kulak mm -hmm. has looked good. Uh, you know, change the things, start to get physical. Uh, I love the way Montreal played Tampa physically on game four. But to talk about Tampa on the other side, Braden Point's been unbelievable. Kucherov has just been absolutely lethal. Um, you know, our next topic in the NHL is going to kind of involve him in regards to his Tampa building a dynasty. Um, but overall, I just, Stamkos to me, is, I mean, as good as it's been, you look at their power play, Jerry. They're going, their lateral movement, their puck movement is scary. so good. Very scary. And then you look at their blue line. I mean, led by Victor Hedman. You got Ryan McDonough, who's been an absolute stud. And then, of course, they acquired David Savard, former Monk the Wildcat MVP. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, you know, they're so much fun to watch. And again, I would love nothing more than see the Habs come back and win this series in seven. But I'm a realist. Um, it is going to be a long uphill battle, but if there is a team that can do it, this Habs team's the one. Well, I measure a lot of what I watch with hockey in um, desire, and uh, Tampa is very good when it's around the puck or battling for a puck. And I thought in the early stages of game number four, the eleven-one shots, let's say, before you know Anderson scores on the second shot by the Montreal Canadiens, that all it was all Tampa just. Yes, on every puck, 
and hard on every puck. They're hard all over the ice, and they're they're a pressure type of team. But ESPN put out a stat, Chris, getting back to your turnovers, and I don't remember what they said on how many goals, but uh, and it might have been on 10 goals or eight goals. That seems to ring a bell that came 10 seconds after a Montreal turnover. Yep. That every time that Tampa scores, it would happen pretty much immediately 10 seconds after Montreal's made a turnover. So it's, it's pretty simple game. Don't turn the puck over, keep it simple, stupid, and have your goaltender play well and have some heart and desire and battle for every puck you have a chance for. That's what I love in a team. And that's what I see with Tampa. They're hard on every puck and they're determined on every puck and they're very creative as well, but and I still can't, you know, I still can't count out those Montreal Canadiens. And, you know, they've, they've, they've been down 3-1 before. Uh, and, but Tampa's a different animal than Toronto. So uh, game five is a very uh, entertaining game. Uh, you're absolutely right. All right. So let's move on from that series in general. And I want to talk about some other topics in regards to the National Hockey League, sticking with the Tampa Bay Lightning. So, you know, there's a few things you got to look at right now. And that is one. Could Tampa possibly looking to build a dynasty at this point? I mean, they were so good. They were cup winners last year. Looks like, I mean, again, I, I hope I'm eating my hat when this is over, but it looks like, you know, they have a lot of opportunities to close this series out in the next couple of days. Um, you know, and next year, I, like for me personally, there's going to be a lot of issues because you've got the expansion draft coming in a couple of weeks. They're already, what, $18 million over the salary cap. So they're going to have to address that as soon as the season's over. They're arguably, in my opinion, going to lose an entire line somewhere along the way. I mean, what are your Absolutely. thoughts on Tampa? Yeah. Oh, no, they're going to lose some depth for sure. And that's always what happens uh, with an expansion, number one, but with a successful team that's developed their own players, but eventually you have to pay those players. And as they move up in their stature and their seniority, how many games they've been playing and contracts coming to an end, that's when they need to get paid and there's only so much room. We all know it's been documented. You know, Kucherov was out all season long and that allowed them to keep that team intact. And then when he comes back for the playoffs, it doesn't have a hit on your salary cap. So uh, it was a loophole that they found and they've used it very well. But when reality is going to come back in to play here, um, yes, they're going to lose some depth. I would say, as you say, I think they would lose a line. They're not going to be able to keep all those defensemen, Chris. And so it, it, a dynasty would be tough. But if you still have that, to me, and, and Chicago did it with their core up front and their core on the blue line and Corey Crawford in that, they got two Stanley Cups out of that team. Now, you know, Tampa uh, after a COVID-shortened season. But I don't see, you know... Uh, with creativity they have in Tampa, I don't see where they can't fit other people to those spots. And especially, who knows what they have in the minors that, that, that then gets elevated again and you start that cycle again. You have to have a good, uh, you have to have a, a, a good scouting staff and good product that's ready to move up and take on the brighter light. No, you're absolutely right. And if you look at some of the young talent Tampa has in that roster now, I mean, they're going to ask Matthew Joseph to step up and play a bigger role. I mean, he's right. a fantastic um, where I question is, and you know, Braden Point's been fantastic. Uh, Sorelli's been good. I really like everything they bring. But to me, one of my favorite guys to watch in Tampa has been Ryan McDonough. Like, I just love guys like that who just play their position to a T. And, you know, again, look at Patty Maroon. Patty Maroon's looking to win his third straight Stanley Cup. I mean, mm -hmm. that's phenomenal. What about you know, what's going to happen at this expansion draft, Chris. There's going to be some possible big names being moved around. Certainly, uh, Ron Francis and his staff aren't going to sneak up on these general managers anymore. And nope. isn't there some scuttlebutt that, you know, even Duncan Keith, with his big salary and he's getting older, might be uh, moving on to a, a different location? Yeah, I mean, a lot of rumors floating around right now, and it looks like Edmonton seems to be the destination they're talking about, a guy like Duncan Keith. But, yeah. Know, I, I'm a hit or miss situation right now. I mean, you look at what the Oilers need and what they have to do. Overall, Tell me what I'm they just, need, Chris. First thing, what do they need? Uh, if I'm the Oilers right now, they need a goaltender. There you go. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. No, you're at yeah. And then at that point, you build the yeah, build from the blue line out. You're right. Some guys, some guys are going to be moving around, and Edmonton's going to be a prime destination because don't think Connor McDavid's going to settle for mediocrity for much longer. No, um, can't. You no. Know, Exactly. Nor should he have to. Um, but overall, yeah, if Duncan Keith's a good fit there, I'd honestly like to see when this is over. If I'm going, if I'm Edmonton right now, why not take a stab at a guy like Pat Maroon? Why not bring a guy like him in? I mean, anyways, well, I don't know. Did, 
Yeah, there could he be a lot going on. He never did play in Edmonton, did he? Pat Maroon never played in Edmonton. No, no. I'm thinking I'm getting mixed up, mixed up with Cassian. Yeah, so I mean, overall, play. plus, I mean, don't forget the UFAs that are coming up. This is a big year. Yeah. Ovechkin's still not signed, although he'll probably sign. Taylor Hall, um, you know, the Habs are going to have to make some decisions on tomorrow phase as well. There's some guys. Nick Suzuki is probably going to get paid max deal, probably eight years, I would assume. Um, I don't know who's going to be moving around, but yeah, it's going to be a fun time. And the draft is in Jerry. I can't believe this conversation is already 10 minutes in. Let's transfer. Let's get out of the national <laughs> hockey league. Uh, big news coming out of the Canadian hockey league, though, the Memorial cup that we've been talking about year after week, after week, after week, it's finally looks like it's heading back into play. We were right all along. It looks like it will be in the QMJHL. It is official that the Quebec ramparts and the St. John sea dogs have officially put a bid in to host the MasterCard Memorial cup in 2022. Both uh, locations have uh, via, you know, uh, uh, very valid uh, reasons why it should be in their city. And, you know, you remember the time when St. John's been against Shawinigan and they handed it Shawinigan. And, and I, uh, I, I hope it doesn't happen again. But, you know, Quebec's a big shiny tool they got there with that new arena and how things have, you know, it's so professional there with the size of that arena and Patrick Waugh, the coach and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, I, hopefully it's, it's uh, conducted fairly without bias. And here's St. John taking another shot at it. And I think they would have a lineup of the two. I could be wrong again, that would be looking at that on paper, but I've seen this St. John team for three years now and it's building towards this. Just hope it happens. That's what Trevor Georgie has been talking about for years after year after year with this team. And you're absolutely right. I think they are going to have the team to do it. Um, they'll make that decision. I believe everything has to be submitted and sent in uh, by August. I believe and the decision's made. Is it late August or early September, Jerry? Something like that. Uh, I didn't read that part of it, but it certainly does have to happen yeah. quickly. Because if you win it, there's lots of preparation. People don't realize what goes into putting a bid uh -huh. in for the Memorial Cup. And I mean, you have to submit to the league what your trades are going to look like, what your roster is going to look like. Uh, you know, what events are going to happen around the city, what accommodations, what routes you can take mm -hmm. from the hotel to the rink. Like there is a huge planning committee involved in this. And, uh, you know, maybe in the next couple of weeks, we can see if we can get our good buddy Trevor Georgie on the, on the, on the show here, just to kind of get, you know, maybe get a better understanding as to explain yeah. to the fans what goes into putting a bid together. Yes, you're right. The NBA, Chris is, uh, is rolling along and you have the Suns. And the Bucks, two great nicknames, by the way. Phoenix Suns, Milwaukee Bucks. I love the Antlers again. I'm a big Elks guy, too. I love the Antlers. But uh, I really would like, you know, in my heart, I would th really like to see Phoenix win because Phoenix has never uh, won a championship. And Milwaukee, way back in their day, didn't they win a championship, Chris? Yeah, I think like 74, I think, something along those lines. Yeah. It was a while Eight, ago. I know, but it's nice to see two new faces in the final. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And then for me, it's not even about, you know, never. I mean, yes, the never winning thing is huge for me. I love storylines. And to see Chris Paul putting on the clinic he's putting on right now makes me so excited because everyone thought he was done. People, He was getting crapped on all over social media when the moves came on in. They're like, oh, you're going to build a team around Chris Paul. What a donkey. What a dumpster fire. Your team's toast. I love it. You know, Devin Booker's been playing unbelievable as well. It's a great storyline. Not that I'm trying to take away from Giannis because I love the fact, I mean, look, you want to talk about a guy who's got all the talent in the world, you know, winning MV, multiple MVPs. Looks like he's playing this thing on one leg right now. Um, but, you know, he was a game time decision last night. Looked like he was going to be ruled out. Then all of a sudden, boom, guess what? He's in the warm up and in, 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 in the lineup and he looked good. Um, but overall, I'm with you, Jerry. I, I, you know, I like the fact that these two teams are in the finals, you don't have a Lakers for a change. And I'm a Lakers fan, but I love yeah. that scene, right? Like, I love this stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm with you. I'm rooting for Phoenix on this, and I would love to see Chris Paul get a ring. I don't know who's carrying it, if it's ESPN or TNT or whoever that is down there. But I'm certainly, they're not crazy about a Milwaukee and Phoenix uh, final, just based on the uh, market sizes. Of it's ESPN and ABC. Chris? Oh, is it? Yeah. Chris, um, on to another subject as we're... As we, Moving flowing here. quickly here. We have a Canadian in the semifinals at Wimbledon. That's exciting news. We had a semi in the we had a Canadian in the semis. We had a Canadian in the corners. Um, you know, now Shapovalov's gonna have his hands full with the world number one player here coming up. Yeah. But uh, but overall, absolutely what a great set they played today. Shapovalov, uh, I will say for the record, love the haircut, by the way. Shapovalov's looking real good right now. Uh, and then when he won, the interview he gave, uh, you know, I thought it was amazing when they were talking about what, what an underdog he was going to be to have to play Djokovic. And he was very calm, cool, and collected, and very Canadian-like, and goes, hey, you know what? He's like, at the end of the day, when the game starts, 
the score will be zero zero. Anything's possible. Yeah, he didn't have uh, when I f- uh, switched it on for a minute. Uh, the other fellow was wearing the cap backwards, and I thought that was him rather than him wearing the headband. He's gone right. to a different look. Yeah, like I said, I mean, it all stemmed. I mean, like I said, he cut that long hair, changed the headband look, everything yeah. was him. Absolutely no. I, I look, I love Shapovalov, and you know, I, I love what Djokovic has done too. If you look at look at how great tennis has been, Jerry, in the last twelve to fourteen years, and how it's changed i mean we've got nadal federer djokovic we've got arguably the best mm-hmm. players in the history and it all like in our time right now and now we've got shapovalov coming in and i love these canadians coming on through remember milos was a hot hit for a long time too yes and tennis is a big deal right now and i absolutely love it i mean it was tough to see oj asalim uh alice M, when he got eliminated in the quarters as well but overall i mean it's absolutely it's great it's great for canadian tennis and it's great for the game yeah and i want to get in dress cue back into the uh fold i mean she hasn't really played a full tournament since the u.s open and um great character and a great personality for for uh, canadian tennis i want to see her get back into the stream of things and speaking of canada and the team that we have that plays baseball in canada toronto blue jays as we near the midway point and the all-star break coming up chris are going to be well represented Hoof, are they ever? Um, you know, right now, which is great, they've got four. Like, they got four players heading to the All Star game. Three of them in starting positions. Um, you know, we've been talking about how good the Jays' offense has been all season long. You know, yes, I think they're still eight, eight and a half games back right now, but that's not a telling sign. You know, they actually moved Roddy Telez this week in kind of a surprising deal to start. Obviously, they figured out their bullpen needs work. I mean, we've been talking about it. They finally looks like they're starting to address it. There's some heavy rumors swirling right now that Kimbrell, Chris Bryant, those type of names are being thrown around in Jay's territory. I don't know if that's something that they can absolutely do, but to see that Vladdy, Simeon, Tioscar, and Bo are all going to be represented at the All-Star game, I think is absolutely great news. Um, you know, it's fun for the city of Toronto. Looks like they might even put in like a, they could be playing back in the Rogers Center here by August, Jerry, is what things are looking yeah. like. Yeah, I think... Uh... The biggest surprise for me, I see uh, Springer is now back in the lineup and playing center field and looking good. Might be more popular, but Simeon, to me, uh, knew nothing about him, even though he does he does have uh, career numbers, but he's impressing me terribly in uh, in his uh, composure and the way he leads off the attack for the team. And uh, I, I've been impressed with him. He's been my brightest star. I mean, uh, my brightest surprise, I guess, because Vladdy. We were hoping he progresses as he goes through his career and uh, this year making some physical changes to himself and playing a solid first base. But Simeon, to me, has has uh, really been a poster boy for me anyways. Absolutely. Simeon's probably been one of the bright lights for me as well. I mean, if you look at their offense in general, I mean, they look, the Jays have been great. But, you know, they're all overshadowed by guys like Vladdy, Bo Bichette, you know, Biggio, um, and Grichik's been playing well, but Simeon yeah. to me has probably been like the highlight. Like I love watching him play. He, I don't see any scenario where he's still in Toronto next year. Um, he's going to get paid next year and rightfully so he's had a great year. Hopefully he's a Red Sox next season. Um, Cause that's the one position they could certainly, you know, they, I would like him to fill that area out. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, to this all-star break, I mean, I love the fact that the all-star break is being represented. Um, what's crazy though, the all-star break is look at, we talked about, uh, uh, you know, Shohei Otani and what he's been yeah. doing this year. So they've got, you know, he, they say that he'll be running the trifecta, you know, he'll be the DH, he'll be pitching. He'll be like, he's going to be everywhere. He's a nut. He's got 30 home runs now. And he's an home run derby. Unbelievable. And he really swats them out. I mean, he is, he's, he's, there, there's no cheap cuts with this guy. No. And somebody asked me the other day, who would you think is MVP not at even to this point? Is it, is it uh, Otani, Otani or, the, or is it Junior? It's Otani. It's not even debatable. It's not. It, ah, it, junior leads in many categories and Otani. But he doesn't pitch every five days. I know. Uh, I still am favor of Vladdy, but um, because he's, he's in the top three in three categories. Otani's average is not what Vladdy's is. He doesn't you know who knock the last player does. was to do the things Otani's doing right now. No, Babe Ruth. I knew you were going to say that. I knew that, of course. But that's what I'm saying. But that's what he's doing is absurd right now. I and look, I'm not taking away from Vladdy in the year he's having because you're absolutely right. If Shohei Otani wasn't doing what he's doing, this is a runaway for Vladdy Guerrero Jr. A runaway. 
But at the end of the day, you know, he's going toe to toe and pace for pace with everything Vladdy's doing and still pitching every five days. I mean, that's yeah. unheard of in today's, I'm in looking, today's baseball. I'm looking forward to the uh, second half. I'm not really a all-star game guy. Um, last year, I remember Vladdy in that marathon of a home run derby that I just turned me right off. Vladdy hit more home runs than the guy that won it, but he doesn't win. And I know right, he did he it pulled out of before year, and all that kind of too. stuff. But what do they do? Right, so, and Vladdy pulled out of the home run derby. This yes. Year, which is right but for him. I'm just Good tired. I'm t- yeah, I'm really – the home run derby has lost a little bit of a, a, a gloss with me. I don't know how you feel about it. No, I'm in this, the exact same boat. I mean, look, I understand what it is. I understand, you know, it's a fan event and, you know, it's to get everybody amped up and to do what they do. Um, but, you know, it's a spectacle. And, and, I, and I, you know, maybe if I'm in the ballpark while this is happening, like maybe I'm there having a good time. Like yeah. if we were down there, you know, having a cold one, Jerry and a hot dog, we'd be having a good time. <laughs> but I agree with you. I mean, like- to sit down and watch this on television, it's just not the same fanfare it used to be. Yeah, I'd like to be anywhere with you have a cold one listen they were having some cold ones in Wembley as uh, yeah. seems like England as we move on to Euro 2021 is going to be in the final of Euro since I think they said 1960 the uh, the British media were just you know giddy with excitement that uh, England has made it to the final with a victory over Denmark and they're going to play Italy on Sunday have you been watching Chris I have been watching um, more so, and I'll be honest, more so the quarters, the semis. Um, I've been trying yes. to catch. I mean, unfortunately, I, I still have a full-time job. Um, it's, getting, it's getting in the way. Um, but overall, you know, you look at how the last few games have gone, getting us to this point. It's been absolutely remarkable. And today, yeah, you know, you know, this week when England wins that game and the fashion they wanted in, you know, we were talking off camera just a little bit and you're right. All it all comes down to that penalty call. And, you know, if you're an official, you, you have to call that because, you know, if you, you don't do, call, you have to, like you said, and I, you worded it perfectly. And that is you're in Wembley. If that does not get called, they'll rip the building down. It was, it was, and I mean, it happens so fast and they slow it down and they get different angles, but it seemed like he had did graze the leg. And you know, when somebody's running fast and you just graze them, they're going to stumble and fall. But the bottom line is, and I wish the NHL referees would do this a little bit more and we'll get, we'll get back to that a little bit in a second, but uh, he had to make the call. What was he not going to make the call? And they right. did review it to overturn and they really don't want to overturn penalty kicks and they let it stand and doesn't the goaltender make a great save, but then Kane's there to bang in the rebound for the winner. And how fortunate that was because the penalty kick itself wasn't that marvelous. And no. the, and the, and the perfectly, and he got his own rebound to get the victory for England. I was more impressed that the same thing had happened. Uh, you know, the, the day before that was when, you know, anytime a goaltender makes a save on a penalty kick, my mind is instantly blown. And this is a guy who played footy his whole life. Like this is, I, like, I understand it. But anytime a goaltender makes a penalty, because you are taught whatever decision and whatever way you're going to go, commit, stick to it, and no one's to blame. Goaltenders are making penalty kick stops right now against the best in the world, and it's mind-blowing to me that he's not boxed out and the guy can basically blast in his own rebound and you know yeah. send England on. I was watching games earlier, and it seems like some teams just play for the tie right from the opening kick. They don't, they're not aggressive enough. I like aggressive soccer. And I guess that's not a fact. That's not a game. I don't know. Um, but there are times if, if I'm, if I'm going to sit down and watch it on Sunday, I can walk way back and I'll still be all right. You right. know, and nothing would have happened because they like go back and forth and back and forth. And please don't squirm and, and, and wiggle on the back. You've seen less of that as it's gone along. And one other point about refereeing, Chris, I noticed the other night when Montreal got the lead, going back to the NHL, how more after Montreal got the lead to give Tampa an opportunity to get back. Just an observation, probably biased indeed. I won't get conversation about officiating and how it gets back in because this we don't have enough time in the show to do it, and you you knew it. I know what you're doing right now. And it's not going to work. But overall, no, I, I absolutely agree. Anyways, uh, Jerry, it is the favorite time of the show. It is time for, you know, the viewers love it. We love it. It's time for the wrap, Jerry, starting with the MFL has wrapped up a couple weeks ago. What was the results? Maritime Football League wrapped up another season. Of course, they didn't play in 2020. 
But the Moncton Mustangs are game champions. They got a 26-14 win over the expansion Fredericton Fleet in Hockey Stone. They have a perfect season at 6-0. They've won three of the last four seasons. And what a great job. It's an exciting brand of football. We had it for you here in Rogers TV. Congratulations to every staff and his players for another fine season. Chris, there was another um, a celebrity golf event. What did you think? I absolutely love these. It's my favorite thing to watch when they get involved. The match four was underway uh, with Aaron Rodgers, Bryson DeChambeau, and with Phil Mickelson and Tom Brady. Uh, you know, Aaron Rodgers clinched it with a birdie putt on 16. They conceded. Match was over. Uh, dethroning the previous champions. I absolutely, like, I think these events are great. I love them being mic'd up. I love them having a good time, chirping back and forth. Um, you know, I, I think, I, I wish more sports did stuff like this. But to watch guys go ahead, I think my favorite part of the whole thing is Tom Brady's golf ball that he's got every Super Bowl he's ever won stamped on the golf balls. I think that's fantastic. It's pretty cool. But yeah, no, the fourth was there. It's absolutely good to see Bryson DeChambeau on the positive side of the media for a change. Good yeah. Good with Aaron Rodgers. I know that Aaron's going to see a lot of scrutiny over the next couple weeks. Um, Jerry, that being said, we're coming down to the point where, you know, you can spend a lot of time in the ballpark in Chatham. What's some uh, rumors <laughs> swirling around there? Well, the Chatham Ironmen are playing currently in the Miramichi Valley Baseball League, but the New Brunswick Senior Baseball League has said to Chatham, if you want to join us for the playoffs, you're more than welcome. Of course, the Islanders are supposed to get into the fold with the with the Moncton uh, Fisher County and the St. John Alpines later on this month. They've invited Moncton to the playoffs, which would get underway in the late stages of August, and uh, Chatham accepted, did play the first place finisher and move on from there. So that's exciting news. Chatham did want to play, and now we're going to be back playing again. And Chris, um, in the Olympics, uh, what is the status of the men's team? Are, do we, are we going to have a team there? Absolutely heartbreaking loss for Team Canada with the uh, basketball team, the men's side. Uh, you know, overtime loss to the Czech Republic. You know, it's unfortunate we will not be there to represent them, but our ladies will be there, and that's exciting news as well. Uh, but yeah, heartbreaking loss for the Canadians. Jerry, that's going to wrap it up. Uh, we've had a great show. We hope you guys have enjoyed it as much as we've enjoyed coming into your living room. Thanks for tuning in, everybody, and we will see you next Thursday.